So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, it'll be a few more minutes. We're going to let people come into the room. We've had a, a sold out um, ticket holding, so we're really going to see if everybody came today. Um, just a reminder that we do record these workshops, and um, so if for some reason you get bumped off, um, just look for an email from me later today with uh, a Marin Master Gardener survey and a link to the recording and any topics that get brought up that we want to, to go back and research. So I try to include any links that we talk to, that's back to the Marin Master Gardeners or any other um, site that our presenters um, tell me. So um, again, today um, we're here with Joe Jennings, uh, our UC Master Gardener and also the president of the Commons Foundation. Um, you can always keep Keep up with the library by following us on our Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook pages. And again, we are recording today's event. Um, so if you, for, like I said, if you get bumped off for some reason, you can always go back and watch this later. Um, today we'll be um, doing Q&A, so just make sure you use the Q&A um, feature in this, or you can type your questions into the chat box. Um, also, we uh, want to remind people, uh, we have a new event, an art event coming up on September 10th um, for all you gardeners who have flowers in yards and you might do flower arranging. Um, we have a, 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 a docent from the De Young Museum who will be coming to talk about the, um, the bouquets of art that they do every year. So we also want to remind everybody that we are providing curbside service here at the library again. Um, we're not open to the public but you can request books online or calling us on the phone. Between um, 11 and 5, we answer the phone, but we do curbside service from 12 to 4. Um, so you can request books, return books, um, get videos, all that stuff you like to do, just got to do it over the phone or through the catalog. Um, So and then um, in September, we have a, a new event that's really aimed for children, our Dig It, Grow, Eat It Part 1, and it's a two-part series um, that will be happening with UC Marin Master Gardeners, um, Danielle Pasha and Catherine Wolf. So if you have any little ones that have green thumbs or anybody who's interested in learning how to garden, join us at those events. Um, you can also sign up if you follow us on our Eventbrite um, page where you signed up for this event. You can follow us there and see all the events that are coming up for the library as we post them. So, so it's a little after 11. So um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the um, Larkspur Library's um, Garden Talk. I'm Franklin Escobedo. I'm the Community Services Director here at the Larkspur Library. Um, we're here today with UC Marin Master Gardener Joe Jennings who's also the president of the Commons Foundation. Um, this event is in partnership with the Commons Foundation and the UC Marin Master Gardeners. Um, and it was made possible by um, the Friends of the Library who helped us get our license for the Zoom. Um, people keep asking why we only have usually 100 tickets. We have a webinar version right now that only allows for 100 people to join us. So um, one day if we get more people, we'll add more, more seats. But for now, um, welcome and I'm gonna Hand this over to you, Joe. So. Hi, everyone. I hope um, August has been kind. Uh, today, uh, I noticed a little counterintuitive, but I, I would like to take you into fall and winter um, and uh, give you a sense of what you can go do with the garden as you go into the shorter days and, and cooler nights. Uh, as Franklin said, I'm with UC Master Gardeners. Um, we're unpaid uh, part of the UC Cooperative Extension uh, Program. So we transfer technology from the UC Horticulture Schools out to the public. Um, we have a website, there's a help desk that you can access by phone or email. And uh, we're really here to help people with their home gardening needs. Uh, I'm a member of the Master Gardeners, that's me on the left. Uh, in the 2012 class, I teach tomatoes, vegetables, citrus tree gardening. I'm a former board member. I'm also president of the Marksburg, uh, the Commons Foundation, which we're raising the money to fund and build and sustain the Larkspur Library. Right now, 
uh, we just launched an annual campaign to support the library's current operations. And in addition, we have a capital campaign seeking to uh, raise the funds to build the new Larkspur Library. And we're also the sponsor of Garden Zooms. Um, so before we start, I, I was asked the other day, well, you know, I, with the library closed uh, and these garden Zooms, how do I get books on the, about the subjects you're talking about? And the fact is the library is not closed. You can go online or over the phone and order books. So recent garden Zoom classes, one by Tony Gatoni, who's a local uh, author and speaker, uh, is called Lifelong Gardener. That's available in hard copy. There was a, a wonderful class on bulbs, uh, flowering bulbs the other day. There's a beautiful California Gardeners resource that has an extensive section on bulbs. Um, we had a wonderful class on native plant gardening, which is um, one of the best resources is this California Native Plants for the Garden book by Bornstein. That's available in the library as well. Today's class, the best uh, resource for that is the Golden Gate Bar Gardening book by Pam Pierce. That's available in hard copy at the library. And then I'm always looking for what are the new books that people may want to read about gardening. And uh, Sue Stewart-Smith, who is a psychologist who lives in England, published uh, The Well Garden Mind um, earlier this year. It was a big hit in England. And now it just came out in the United States. And we have uh, uh, hard copies available at the library. Uh, and it's also, uh, if you want, you can access through the library, The New Yorker, and get the August 17th. They did a rather extended article about both the book and the author and the role of gardening uh, during times of high stress. Um, and so it may be something you want to read because it, it's, it's not just about gardening, but how gardening is good for you in terms of mental health. So um, these are all books that are available at the library. Uh, so what you do is you can either go online through MarinNet and order the book, or you can call 415-927-5005 and order it. And then this is an image of the curbside pickup on the side of the library. So if you have any questions about that, we'll uh, answer them at the, at the end. But I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew we have a really robust set of library books some wonderful new ones, and um, you should be reading them if you have the time because they're just wonderful extensions of what we covered in the Garden Zoom. So um, today, I would like to walk you through sort of first principles about fall winter vegetable gardening, and then we're really talking about cool weather vegetables, and then what you can do in containers and how to think about growing your soil over the winter, and then just the general maintaining your garden during the winter. Um, now, as we go into these subjects, I will stop regularly to answer questions. So if you have a question, if you type it in on the Q&A, then um, uh, Franklin will be uh, curating those and asking me when we break. Uh, so, oh, by the way, these are all, uh, vegetables that I've grown in my garden in the last few years. So that, that uh, you see scallions and then um, rainbow shard and then broco broccoli. Um, so, but before we start, um, the, the basic question, we're sitting here at the end of August and we're thinking about fall, winter vegetable gardening. The really basic question is, you know, objectively, how much time do you have for the garden going into this winter. Um, you, now that we're in COVID times, maybe we have more time than we would have otherwise, but you have to be sort of honest with yourself. Um, I have talked to people who said, you know, I had big designs for this winter's garden or this garden any season, um, but I was trying to get my child into college as an example, or I was moving my parents into assisted living or whatever. So calibrate how much time you think you really do have. Um, and it's good always sort of to take a, a moment to say, how, how is the soil? Is this the winter that I focus on just growing my soil? Um, and then also, 
you know, for each one of my garden beds, when and what am I planning to plant next spring? I'll talk about this more later, but if you know that this is the bed that you want to plant um, lettuces in or tomatoes in April, then probably you shouldn't plant onions that won't be ready to be harvested until July um, in that same bed. And then have you thought about crop rotation and amendment? And the reason I say this is these are the questions that you shouldn't create stress for yourself by trying to do more than you have time for or uh, do things that um, then you're going to still sit there and say, I should have done more for the soil or where you're worried that you're not going to get this crop harvested before you're planting the next one. So just so that you cut yourself a bit of slack when you start this process. Um, by the way, that's uh, an onion I grew. Um, uh, I had my wife hold it so that it makes it look bigger, but it was a reasonably good sized onion last year. Um, so fall and winter vegetable gardening, the three things to get your head wrapped around. Um, the chart in the lower left is we're in, uh, in June, the, the June 20th is the longest day of the year, 14 hours and 48 minutes of sunshine. December 21st is the shortest, nine hours. So there's a five hour swing in amount of sunlight. And so your garden goes from being drenched with sunlight and heat between you know, May 1st and October 1st to being having a lot less sun all winter. So it's one of the things to think about. Also, what's the angle of the sun? How does it change in your garden? I have some garden beds that get tons of sun in the summer and they are shaded in the winter. So think about that first. Likewise, um, you're gonna go through this temperature decline and frost risk. There aren't, the whole county of Marin, almost every community in the county has risk of frost basically starting in October and running to either April or May. And so when you're thinking about cool weather crops and what I'm always worried about is, are we gonna have a frost tonight? It's another thing to pay attention to. I wish rainfall was consistent, but it isn't. The chart in the lower right corner shows you that in all probability, rain will start sometime between October and November and run through April, May, but those start dates and ending dates have been moving around lately. And also we can get a month of no rain in the middle of the summer. Um, so you need to pay attention to the rain level because most people are used to turning off their irrigation in on November 1st and not worrying about it till May. Well, if you're growing vegetables and they need water and we either don't get rains starting in late October, early November, or we get a drought in the middle of the winter like we've had in the past, you have to be paying attention to it. So this is sort of the landscape of all the things to keep in mind. Um, Franklin, is there a question? Yeah, so we have one, it's, I have root rest eating all my string beans, kale, lava, and melons, and I'm going to enclose my five by 15 raised bed with half inch wire mesh, sides and tops. Is there anything else I could, can suggest to keep them way short of enclosures? I won't trap them. I, I'm afraid not because um, enclosure short of trapping is probably the only thing you can do. But let me hold other questions about uh, pests and things to the end because I have a section on it. Um, so let me go back to, um, um, so when you're thinking about how much time you have, if you have time, you can grow vegetables. If you don't have time or you have soil issues, plant a cover crop. So this is the first sort of big division you need to make thinking about fall winter is, am I going to, is this the year I'm going to focus on um, specialty fall winter cool crops or 
because I don't have any time and I know it, I'm gonna plant cover crops and try and work on the soil. So this is this, it's a really basic decision. And frankly, I'm personally wrestling with it right now because there's some things I'd love to grow. On the other hand, I have some beds that need significant soil amendment improvement. Um, um, and, and on the vegetable side, what we're really doing is going from warm season vegetables to cool season vegetables. And the warm season, you know, this is what we've been living through, 65 to 95 or hotter days, uh, warm nights, the soil is warm. When you switch to winter, it's shorter, cooler days, colder nights, and the daytime temperatures are much lower. So your, your palate of what you can grow, it changes. So I tried to divide up fall and winter, two ways to look at it. First off, are there some things that you can grow quickly that you could have in be enjoying relatively soon, like beets, carrots, kale, lettuce, onions, peas, radishes, spinach, Swiss chard. And then there's some others that winter over like asparagus, rhubarb, kale, garlic, radicchio, horseradish, artichokes and watercress. So these would be the winter over vegetables are things that are already in the garden. So you wanna identify those and we'll talk about how to take care of them. And then look at the rest of your garden beds and say, am I looking for something that will, I'll be eating before Thanksgiving? Or is it something that will be for later in the winter? The winter overs, um, in most cases, you're gonna pick a day in the fall. And I traditionally pick October 1st, just because it's, it's easy to manage. And you're gonna cut these winter over vegetables down. If you have, um, in some cases like the artichoke or the rhubarb, you might divide the rootstock. But the real point is, you wanna put a lot of compost around these vegetables that are wintering over because they've been feeding on the soil all summer. So the sort of October one date would be the day, cut the plants back, add a lot of compost, work the soil, and then let them winter over and then they'll be ready to be back in, in the game in the spring. But this wintering over, you kind of have to look through the garden and say, where are these plants? Well, how are they doing? And can I prepare them for a, a winter over? Now the quick vegetables, assuming it's September, it's extraordinary to me that it's already September, but be that as it may, if we had started, had this class in July, I would have told you get seed trays and start everything except your carrots by seed around August 1st. But now that we're in September nearly, the carrots probably should only be put in by seed but everything else I would buy starts because you wanna be harvesting them, you know, within a reasonable period. So, and by the way, the, the image on the left were um, last winter's sweet peas, which did very well, the um, Oregon sugars. So if your goal is to have food to eat this fall, then you take the quick vegetables and put them in. If your goal is to have slower arcing winter vegetables, then artichoke, beans like fava beans, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collards, garlic sets, potatoes, rhubarbs, and shallots. These are all things that if you're planting now, you'll be harvesting next year. So that's your another split to keep in mind. Um, so before we move on, uh, Franklin, are there some questions? Yeah, the first one is, do you have any, um, do you have the same soil concerns if you're container gardening or can you replace or rotate soil? So I'm about to go into a big soil section, but honestly, I worry about soil all the time. So I'll, I'll answer more of that in the next section. Okay. And then the next one is, um, what is your favorite seed source? Um, and starter source. 
So as master gardeners, uh, we can't endorse uh, different sources. Um, but what I would say is I would research and see who has the best reviews. And also if you have other friends that use people to see what they use. Um, and we've also had periods where it's just been like last spring, it was just very hard to find seeds at all. So this might continue this fall. So if you're looking for quality seeds, I'd be buying them right now. So the next one is, how do I plant those winter starts on September 1st when summer and tomatoes uh, are still here? Just add new beds? <laughs> no, no, no. So uh, what I would do is I, I have an old seed tray that I've kept forever. So it's a two inch deep with little tiny uh, pockets and you fill it with potting soil and then you plant the seeds in there and leave it on the, in, on the patio so it's shaded in the afternoon and it gets morning sun. And then you water it every day very carefully because you can wash away the seeds. So I would start seeds, if you're starting something from seed now, I would start it in my uh, seed tray and then be prepared to transplant it. The problem is it's hard to transplant something like carrots. They don't like being moved. So if you're planting carrots, you need to plant them where you're going to actually have them grow. So the next one is, would you please recommend a winter crop for a designated tomato bed? And yes, will we amend the soil before planting ah, tomatoes? So um, the good news is the way to look at it is to work backwards. So if you thought I'm gonna plant tomatoes on August, April 15th, then you'd want to prep the soil for that at least two weeks in advance, preferably four weeks. So call it March 30th. So you can look in Pam Pierce's book, uh, which I referenced earlier, or on the Master Gardener website. But then you can look at the fact that if you're planting uh, the, the faster crops, let me move back one. Um, like kale or lettuce or peas or spinach or Swiss chard, you should be able to have had those crops harvested and then turn the soil, added new compost and prepped, and then planted your tomatoes in April. What you don't want to do is have things like onions um, or broccoli and cauliflower that can run later into the spring so that you, your space is taken. Did that make sense? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm used to asking, and then, but none of you were here. Um, yeah, somebody is confused about the. Um, they thought carrots were the only things you suggested starting from seeds. Well, and well, it's good point. If you want to have things to harvest in November, December, um, it's pretty tight if you're starting now. If you're starting from seed, whereas if you planted starts now you'd be pretty certain you'd be able to harvest those quick plants by, you know, early fall. The carrots, um, you're going to have to look at the variety of carrots for the ones, the smaller carrots that are faster growing, but those could go in the ground as seed now and be ready, hopefully by Thanksgiving or Christmas. Someone's asking, have you grown potatoes and have you started them from I? Yes. And by the way, uh, potatoes are a wonderful winter crop, a great fun. Um, and, and I highly recommend everyone should experiment with purple potatoes and these red potatoes and these, all these things that you only see at very fancy, you know, farmer's markets and whatnot. Um, but Marin is a wonderful winter potato crop growing place. So I highly recommend it. I have two varieties of potatoes right now that I put in and I'm very optimistic about. Okay. And then someone asked for kale planted in the spring. Is it better to, re to remove it now that it's bitter and tough or will new leaves, start, leaves be sweet? Um, I've, I, we've got, um, we use the dinosaur kale and you can cut it back 
significantly or start and put in new plants. Um, some years we can winter over kale and, uh, and some years it doesn't work, it gets tough and nasty. So it's sort of, a, you play it by ear by year. Um, do, do potatoes attract moles and voles? Um, if it's in the ground without a um, gopher basket, yes, they do. Uh, so if you're in a raised bed, you're protected, but if it's in the ground, yes, they do. So I'm, I'm going to keep moving now, um, but keep those thoughts. Um, so if you've decided that you don't have time this year to be in the garden a lot, um, cover crops, or known as green manure, are crops that fix nitrogen in the soil um, and they help with the water penetration and tilth and they add organic matter to your soil and it's a fantastic way of building your soil over the winter for next spring. So um, the top picture here is of uh, fava beans uh, this is at a, a church garden in Belvedere where I took care of the vegetable garden for a number of years. This, these plants were planted on October 1st by seed. And then you cut the plants down on March or eight, March 1st to 15th. And then when you turn the soil, this lower photo is of the root system. And those white nodules you can see on the roots, that's nitrogen. So when you turn the soil and you chop up the roots, it releases the nitrogen into the soil. And then when you plant your tomatoes, your soil is just exploding. It's amazing. Um, now, there are some drawbacks to cover crops. If you're growing a cover crop, you can't have other things in that space. It takes some work to you know, to process them and get them to work. Uh, but by the way, um, the master gardeners in Sacramento have a wonderful cover crop uh, website. It's, and the link is right there and this will be posted so you can look, pick it up later. Um, and, and the way it works is basically the plants pull nitrogen out of the air and store it in their root systems. And in the case of a fava bean, they're storing it until they're when they go to flower is when you want to cut the plant down because right after that, if they go to growing beans, the plant consumes the nitrogen to grow the beans. So the perfect timing of this is you have these robust plants, they're two, three feet tall, they go to flower and when they go to flower, that means they've, they've put the nitrogen in the root system so they're getting ready to produce beans, that's when you cut them down. Um, and so there, what you're adding is both organic material, the root system to the soil and nitrogen. So it's very cool. Um, now, um, I don't know why this slide's here, here. So, um, when you think about this, one of the other interesting side effects is whether you're growing fava beans or peas and oats or common buckwheat or crimson clover, it adds color to your garden in the winter. So rather than let the soil just sit vacant, put a cover crop in and it takes a minimum amount of work for most of the winter. And then in the spring, you can chop it up, turn it under and your soil will be much stronger. Uh, any questions on cover crops? So um, I think someone's asking, do green beans fix nitrogen in the soil? I actually don't know um, because I eat them. Um, I don't know. I should know that, but I don't. Someone, <laughs> and then someone said... Um, Wait a moment, that's from Jane say? Scourge. She should know more than yeah. I do. This is a <laughs> master gardener who gave two great classes this summer. Ah, sorry. So, and then um, someone asked, when did, when did you say to plant the fava beans? Was it October 1st? 
I, I have a, a schedule in my head, which is my summer garden is officially over Columbus Day weekend or October 1st. So I take things out, harvest everything, repair the soil, and then plant whatever I'm doing for winter. Because if you start to sort of milk your summer garden, as you'll wake up and it's Thanksgiving and you haven't planted anything new and things aren't working very well anymore. So I have this sort of October 1st switch over date and then somewhere between March 15th and April 15th switching over for spring summer. So it's just a discipline because otherwise I'm not that disciplined. Okay, and someone's asking, when you say chop it up, are you chopping up the green of the plant too, or just the root? Uh, it, it, you're, you're, um, you're gonna, the fava beans and the clovers can produce a lot of bulk. So I, above ground, so I take that out and put it in the compost bin, and then I turn the root systems over and chop that up to build the soil. And then someone's asking, are any cover crops edible? Well, um, that's the problem. If you wait for fava beans to be edible, they've used the nitrogen. It, so it defeats the purpose. So um, I think in most cases, I have to think about the peas example, but in most cases, you're not eating this, these crops. Okay, and then um, will cover crops grow in a not so good soil? Actually, that's the whole point. If you have um, cover crops build soil. So actually, it's very interesting. The first reference to cover crops is by Pliny the Elder, who was a Roman scholar um, in the 200s, I think. And so cover crops have been a known agricultural practice forever. And it's essential anywhere where you have crops like tomatoes that are heavy feeders to do something to restore the soil. So this has always been seen as a relatively low labor way to build your soil over the winter so that then you can turn it and have a spring crop with a better soil base. So if there aren't any other questions, I'll move on. Um, So I, I like to point out um, a lot of us have container gardens and um, we need to think, even if you have a lot of other garden beds, containers have some advantages in the winter that are really interesting. One, you can move them around to where the sunlight is in December. Um, two, you, if you know frost is coming, you can roll containers into your garage or at least under the eaves of your house so they're more protected. And three, if you know a, a pretty bad storm is coming, again, you can roll them against the side of the house so they're more protected. One of their other advantages is they put, uh, they make beautiful color for your deck and entryways. So uh, as long as you're deer protected, uh, using uh, winter vegetables in containers is a really great idea. Um, but they need to be big enough. And so if you're serious about vegetable gardening, I recommend to most people get a five gallon or larger container. Plastic works perfectly well. You don't want to have dishes because you don't want to have the plants sitting in water. Um, Personally, I augment my soil in my containers regularly by adding compost and compost tea. Uh, but once a year, I empty the container out and pull the soil out because there'll be roots and all kinds of stuff in there and rebuild each container. And so I'm going to be doing that um, in Oct on October 1st again. Uh, the thing to remember is retainers need uh, you to run your irrigation in shorter frequency, shorter length of time, but more frequent. So if the rest of the vegetable garden is getting a 20 or 30 minute soak twice a week, 
your container, as soon as you start to see water running out the bottom, turn the irrigation off because it's not helping you. So more frequent short durations is good. And this chart, by the way, is in the Pam Pierce Golden Gate Gardening book, but it tells you what crops go grow in what depth container. And so these bigger crops like broccoli and Brussels sprouts and cabbage and cauliflower all can be grown as winter crops, but you need a deep container. So any questions on containing to containers before I move on? Yeah, someone asked, what do you do with the soil you remove from containers? I, I spread it around the garden, or you can dump the soil out, get the debris out of it, and then add compost to it and put it back in. So, and another one for containers is, what if you must have dishes under your containers, apartment, garden with people below? Do you have recommendations for that? Oh, I, I don't know how that, um, I don't know. That's a tough question. Um, I, the problem is then keep an eye on it so that you don't have too much standing water. Um, I appreciate the apartment living with people below you, but that means really pay attention to your irrigation. And then if you have a lot of rain, go out and take a look and make sure that they're not sitting in water. Other questions? They're, they're not pertaining to um, containers. Okay, um, we'll pick them up at the end. Yeah. Um, so, so at a basic level, when you pick a date to switch over your raised beds or your in-ground garden, the thing you want to do is remove the summer crops and get the stems and roots and leaves and debris out because if there are any diseases or insects on them, you don't want them wintering over. You want to make sure that you've removed all weeds from the garden. You want to check your irrigation lines and drainage because in the winter when you get rain, you don't want standing water in your vegetable garden. And it's time to do repairs. Now, um, this was my raised bed a couple of years ago, which I had bought and supposedly it was supposed to have a long life ahead of it. And after four years, it had started to rot out. And I was casually walking by and for no reason, I guess I bumped it and this board fell over, which is not good. So it, 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 it had taught me to look at your raised beds, look at your irrigation, make sure things are draining correctly, make sure you don't have a, a broken line where water is just flowing, and do all that before winter when you're doing the garden cleanup. And now about soil. So organic soil is something rich in humus, um, which means it has decaying material in it and that helps hold moisture. It, it's loose and fluffy. There's air in it, which roots want. So there's this interesting mix of organic material, a little bit of clay, a little bit of sand. And I love this quote that good soil is a combination of the living, the recently dead, and the very dead. Um, and what this means is it should be rich with microbes and other living organisms. And that there's green plant material that's breaking down and releasing nutrients and that the humus which is this final residue is there because it it, it adds soil structure and it helps suppress disease when you're thinking about soil in the winter you also and year round you also have to say well and then do i need to add uh, mulch on top to retain moisture and suppress weeds. And so at a generic level, when you look at soil, you can add compost for organic material. You can add limited amounts of manure for nitrogen. You can plant cover crops to grow the soil even further. 
and then you can use mulch to preserve moisture and to fight weeds. It's, it's kind of a constant thing for me. Every twice a year, uh, I go through this big thing of my raised beds, I'm, the soil in the middle of the raised bed is four or five inches taller than the edge. And that's because all of that organic material is going to uh, decompose during the growing season and the plants that I've planted are going to live off of it. So you're always going to be building your soil. And if you look at a garden bed as something that your job is to grow the soil and the garden bed will grow the plants, then you've got the relationship basically right. Um, so let's, let's deal with soil. Uh, further questions on soil, uh, Franklin, if there are any. So far, no. Um, oh no, with, with heavy rains, is there any, anything one can do to retain nutrients in the soil? Um, I, I don't think, I, I think the, the issue with heavy rains is that um, the soil can get saturated, um, but I view it as I, I add a lot of uh, compost in the fall and in the spring, and basically for the next six months, it's breaking down and being distributed in the soil. The advantage of compost over additives is it releases nutrients at about the rate that plants can absorb them. Whereas I've also learned to how, to, how to use additives selectively when you're trying to boost, um, for example, tomatoes um, during season. So that's where you're kind of giving a shot in the arm to the plant. But the nutrients that get released by compost get released sort of evenly over the period while it's decomposing. So whether it's raining or not, um, the saturated soil can be a problem, but it dries out here pretty quickly. So I wouldn't worry that much. Other questions, Franklin? Okay. So um, what type of mulch should be used in the raised beds? Um, so let's break that into two groups. If you have, if you're in Mill Valley or one of the coastal areas that's cool, then um, I have talked to more and more gardeners who use um, stones to uh, retain heat and reflect light for during the summer. So there's strategies where you want your mulch to be part of heat retention and light reflection versus just purely weed suppression and moisture. Everybody else, um, frankly, uh, compost in a way can be a form of mulch. But I would go look on the website for Master Gardeners under mulch because you can get very detailed on what types of mulch to use for different purposes. Any other questions, so, Frank? That was the next one. What is a safe mulch? Is redwood, uh, is redwood like shown okay? Uh, redwood can be, but also it can be acidic. So um, I'm showing it because it, in some gardens it's fine, but if you're worried about the acidic level, I would look for other mulches. Okay, and then um, how deep do you dig in, in your raised bed soil? Do you leave bottom soil structures alone? It's interesting. Um, Soil structures become increasingly important. I get, I personally worry about disease in the root systems of things like tomatoes. Or I planted mammoth sunflowers this year, which have huge root systems. So when you're thinking about how deep to dig, I think first, how do I get the existing plant structure out? And then I try to leave the rest of the soil as un uninterrupted as possible but it just depends on what you planted. If you have a whole lot of shallow plants like lettuces, this, then you're barely disturbing the soil when you take them out in the fall. Whereas if you had sunflowers or tomatoes, 
they have these deep extensive root systems that you'll want to get out so it just depends on what you planted other questions the uh, I, yeah there's more questions so i've been told i don't have enough calcium in my soil would will add compost resolve this or is there something else i should be adding? yes so uh, after you've had a dozen eggs keep all the shells uh, wash them off, run them through a cow, um, um, a coffee grinder, and you get this white powder that looks, um, uh, well, anyway, you get this white powder. And that, that's almost pure calcium. And so I started using eggshells that have been ground up into powder, and then you, you spread it around the soil and lightly rake it in and add water, and it, it, it boosts your calcium very quickly, and it's free. Well, somewhat free if you have to buy the eggs. So. Well, you were going to buy the <laughs> eggs anyway. I mean, no one bought the eggs <laughs> shells, so it's, it's a byproduct. So do, you, do you dig in the, in the compost or leave it on top? Um, personally, I, I, I rough it in about two inches down and then, and then pile it up above. So I'm trying not to disturb the soil structure too much but I want to make sure that I've loosened in case there's any crustiness in the old soil. Putting the compost in, it will then merge. Okay. And then do you trust compost from external sources or just what you create in your own bins from your own garden prunings and I I I I do I don't have a compost bin, it's a long story. But um I found there's very good compost sources here in Marin. And if you, uh, if you research around, you can see, you know, Yelp reviews and things like that for different vendors. Other questions, Franklin? Well, I got, I, yeah, I'm talking and forgetting to unmute myself. So <laughs> what about clay pan soil? Can you recommend amending or would it be better just to grow it in raised beds and continue? So, um, uh, so depends on what your vegetables you're planning to grow. Uh, Marin County, uh, I have been successful, but it took years to create good soil in the ground in Marin. You will still have virus problems. So for most people who are serious vegetable gardeners, and the older you get, the better it is to have raised beds with a chicken with um, wire mesh below to keep gophers, moles, and voles out. And then uh, you put in uh, a, a, a potting soil for outdoors, to garden soil to get it started. And then I keep building it up with compost every year. Um, you can grow things in the ground in Marin, but you run the risk of having virus problems and then you're always gonna be fighting uh, moles and voles and gophers. So the, one of the last questions is, do you recommend a kit to test the health of the soil? I would check on the Marin Master Gardener site. There are a number of different kits and it, um, they're all available online. So I would check at Master Gardeners. Any other questions then, on the soil? Uh, yeah, so uh, I got compost from Fairfax and nothing is growing in it. Um, do I remove it? No, I would just, I've had some bad soil deliveries over time and you just uh, amend it and add more compost and keep moving. Um, it's every now and then you get a bad batch. Um, it just seems to be the way it is. Okay. So, and then one um, more, all these apples that we have dropping right now, how much is too much to put in the compost? I have no idea. That's a good question. Um, that's the kind of thing that you could email into Master Gardeners and they could help you. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so here are the things, I know it sounds strange, but you have to worry about frost, drought, weeds, pests, and diseases, even in the winter. So let me walk through this. Um, we, every couple of years have three or four days in a row of below 32 degrees weather at night. And it 
we just, everybody in Marin loses a bunch of plants. So as you go into November, starting in October, but certainly by November, keep an eye on the weather forecast. And if it's going to be 32 degrees or less, be prepared. Um, and it's infinitely easier to cover a crop than to try and restore it later. So um, you can buy commercial crop covers. There are lots of them. You can cr create some of your own. <clears throat> but the idea is um, be ahead of the game. Uh, now, if you're not ahead of the game, which many of us won't be, then the next day in the morning, water the soil, not the plants, and wait a few days to see what the damage really is. Sometimes the plants recover just fine, and others you'll see damaged leaves that you can then snip off and the plants will recover. If we have multiple days of frost and your vegetable garden's not protected, you will likely lose a lot of it. So pay attention to frost. About watering. As you know, you know, it's key to seed germination and photosynthesis and nutrient transfer and transpiration. Um, but the trick is, in vegetable gardening in particular, deep watering is best. So you want to water regularly, and different varieties of vegetables have different water needs. So you want to make sure that everybody of the same need is on the same watering line. If you're someone who waters by hand, um, I've actually come to change my opinion of this since COVID, since I'm home, and I have done more watering by hand. Um, there's some virtue to this. I, I must admit, um, going out every morning and actually looking at every plant and in the morning is the time to tell if they're looking a little sad or wilted, then they're short of water is a good indicator. Um, it doesn't sort of matter at the hottest part of the day because that's the most stressed. But if you're hand watering, try to focus on having in your mind, do I water this plant every, every day, every second day, every third day, every fourth day, and roughly how much water am I watering? And so, whether you have an automated system or you're doing it by hand, paying attention both to how much water is this plant receiving, how often is it receiving it, and how is the soil handling? Is the water running off or is it being absorbed? It's, um, I used to be very against hand watering because I didn't think you could be steady enough and be there every day. But um, since I can't travel anywhere, I found I'm here a lot. So there is a virtue to hand watering, but you're not watering the plant. You're watering the root system. So you wanna be down at the soil level when you do hand watering. Um, it's amazing how many weeds grow in the winter. So, what you want to do is make sure that you spot them early and pull them and get the roots out. The problem is if you let them go too long and they go to seed, then you have a much bigger problem. So just walking through the garden, you know, every day or so, every other day, and looking for weeds and pulling them out and getting them into the compost bin before they go to seed, that's the way to handle it. Now, um, if you Google IPM, meaning Integrated Pest Management, at UC Davis, this website is there. And you can click on the Home and Garden, Turf and Landscaping quadrant. And you can find, for whatever plant you have, all of the insects and critters and diseases and environmental effects that affect that plant and also what to do. So it can save you a lot of time and money because if you go to the nursery, they'll automatically sell you something. But the problem you're facing may not need that. So for example, I, when I first started growing artichokes, I woke up one day that I was running basically uh, an aphid hotel 
there were aphids all over this thing. Well, if I'd gone to the nursery, I would have bought some spray to spray for aphids. I went on the IPM site and you use a hose and you power wash them off of your artichoke. And what happens is it breaks their noses and they can't climb back on and attach. So it's free, it's less invasive than spraying would have been, and it was very effective. So it's UC um, Davis IPM, and this will give you the research you need to take care of pests. Now, about harvest. Um, ripeness drives harvest, and ripeness relates to what we eat, not the state of the plant's seeds in all cases. So you have to stay on top of your plants in the winter because it's interesting to me how many, how many times I've let a week or two go by and then I go out and, it, and, the, and the plants have bolted, actually gone to seed because they went through the window when you could have harvested them. So one of the benefits of winter vegetable gardening is you have vegetables, but you have to harvest them. You have to be paying attention. Um, so why do this? Uh, I think of it, and this new book, um, uh, Gardening, uh, was by um, the British author. Um, winter vegetable gardening is a time to sort of be part of a transition. You have this abundant garden now, and it either can transition to a quiet resting period or a winter growth period, but it's a way to not lose touch with nature as you go into the cooler part of the year and the darker part of the year. And for all of us who have been sort of sheltering in place since March, I, I urge you to look at your winter vegetable garden as an opportunity to continue to stay connected even under the current circumstances. So even if you know you're not going to have much time, at a minimum, go plant cover crops. But if you do have time, take the advantage of this and watch this transition. It's, it's a beautiful thing to watch and participate in from spring, summer, to fall, winter, and then back again. And so it's a time where you can either be quiet and watch the soil rest and grow, or provide new growth and new vegetables to enjoy during the winter. Um, so that's the high notes. I'll answer questions now, but just if you want more information on Master Gardeners or, or sign up for our um, magazine, our quarterly newsletter, the leaflet. Here are the barcodes. Um, and now, thank you so much. And I've just, these two photos, a, a brief before we take questions. The plant on your left is a, is a beautiful broccoli plant that I used on a deck um, during the winter to just be something interesting and pretty to look at. Uh, and then it turns out that, of course, broccolis are flowers. So, it's a beautiful plant, and likewise, I've done the same with cauliflower. So broccolis and cauliflowers make wonderful deck plants in the winter. So if you're really thinking, I've got this set of pots with flowers in them, and I, we're going into winter, well, here's something you can grow that would be beautiful, and you can eat it and enjoy it. So um, let me look at the questions. I can now take a break and look. Um, well, hang on a second, Joe. So I, I forgot to launch this poll. So I, I forget to take account of all of our Marin Master Gardeners. So if, uh, you guys, if you're a Marin Master Gardener, um, please click on this so I can get a count of how many are in the audience today. Okay. So um, I, I will put the slide with the book recommendations on the end. Um, uh, and we'll include and, them in the email too. Right. Um, I don't know about water fluoridation and chloridation and uh, on the impact on vegetables. Um, winter squash versus summer squash. Um, I would look in Pam Pierce's book. This is for Diane Zissing. 
Um, Diane, uh, I don't know, but Pam Pierce would know. Um, and yes, I, I rake mulch to the side, add compost, and then put the mulch back over the top. Um, if you're in apartments, uh, maybe keep it raised feet or brick in the dish so the dish captures. That's a great idea. Uh, this is from Deborah. So if you're worried about having dishes under your pots, but you want to keep the pot up out of the water, you can put a brick or a little feet there so that it's not sitting in the water. Um, Michael, fava beans can be eaten too if you cut each other plant, every other plant back. Yes, but then the problem is the fava beans take to the middle of June to be ready to fully harvest. And I need to harvest and get them out of the ground so I can plant tomatoes or whatever's going in. So there are hybrid strategies for fava beans, but uh, I, in the past, have either optimized for eating them or growing the soil. Um, I, oh, now the book list. Let me go back. Um, just quickly. There was also a question about potatoes that was in the chat. Right. Um, so, which, so, which variety of potatoes do you have grown here? And do all varieties see in the farmer's markets do well in Marin? I can't answer the latter question, but in terms of potatoes, since I have the binder right here and I was just researching it myself, um, the potato varieties that do best in Marin include um, right here. So, um, goodness, and Pam Pierce, um, I'm, oh, here we go. Irish cobbler, white cobbler, Kennebec, red Pontiac, bison, uh, all blue, gorgeous potato, by the way, all blue, Yukon gold and yellow fin, um, Russian banana, which is a finger potato, um, Yes. So the interesting thing about potatoes is you also have this wonderful palette of colors that you can grow, purple and yellows and reds and whites. So I, rec I really recommend, you know, people looking at potatoes because it's great fun, particularly with children when you dig them up. Um, next questions. So I'm just, I'm Franklin, I can take it now and look through. So um, Julia wrote, um, do you have the same soil concerns if you're container gardening? I, I do, I, 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 all of you who are container gardeners may have pretty tired soil in your container. So at a minimum, I try to uh, once a year spread plastic, lay the container on the side, pull the soil out, get rid of the roots that are in there, you know, garden tools, children's toys, that garden glove you were missing that got left there, and then mix new compost in with that soil and put it back in. And then I fill them up over the top and you'll watch it drop as you go through the season. Um, thank you for your question, Julia. And then uh, Deborah asked, can lettuces keep regenerating? Um, Yes, it, lettuce is actually, you can, you can keep going quite a ways um, and you, what you're doing is picking the leaves from the bottom and then it keeps growing up. But at some point, the, you'll just see that the plant gets tired. So that's when I swap them out. Romaines can be really easy to manage this way, but also red lettuces and others. But you're not harvesting the head, you're harvesting the leaves. Um, I'm not familiar with what to do with strawberries. I'm sorry, Elise, she was asking, should, do we leave strawberries or pull them out? I, I'm not sure. Um, and then, um, what other questions are there? And can you grow cover crops in containers? Uh, you could, um, but I don't know if it's, it, if it's such a great idea. Um, I suppose you could. I, I, 
I tend to think containers are for even more intensive gardening. So, but there's no reason why you couldn't. Um, any other questions? Um, I hope I've answered most of your questions. Now, I just want to remind you, um, you know, this, this winter gardening thing, or gardening in general, it's supposed to be fun. So we have all these books, uh, and whether you're reading Tony Catoni's Life on Gardener, or this wonderful resource on flower growing, or native plants, or Pam Pierce for vegetable gardening, um, the combination of being outdoors and then there's nothing more thrilling than reading gardening books and seed catalogs during the winter. So if, if you're trying to think what, what should be on my, on my reading list for this winter, they're just wonderful books at the library. And I hope that you combine with fall winter vegetable gardening with reading some good gardening books this winter. So um, I'm afraid we're almost out of time. Franklin, any last things to cover? No, I, someone did have a, one last question about um, when do you know, um, how do you know when the potatoes are ready to be dug up? Ah, well, it's interesting. Um, again, I'm so glad to have my potato book right here. Um, the, the harvest time for potatoes, it's, um, they're ready to harvest two weeks after the plant blooms, typically three months after planting. But then sometimes potato plants don't bloom. Welcome to life. So if you don't see the white or purple flowers, or at least some small branch flower stalks at the tops of the plants, the next hint that harvest time is near is yellowing of the leaves despite regular watering. So as soon as the plant blooms or begins to turn yellow, cut off the watering, and then you can dig the potatoes from that time for about 20% of the plant is yellow to the time the plants completely die. So one of the tricks is you can leave potatoes in the ground for a while. So um, you don't want to leave them too long, but um, as, as the plant is decaying on the surface, at some point you want to make sure you've dug up all the potatoes, but it's great fun. Any other questions? All right, so here's the, here's the takeaway, guys. It's, I know it's um, fire season. I know it's COVID. I know that you're enjoying your tomatoes and your summer crop. Take a few minutes. Think about what you want to do this fall, winter. Think about if you have time, plant vegetables. If you don't, plant a cover crop. Think about how you're going to build your soil. Pick a day in October to do the cutover. And then also know... You know, roughly, when are you going to go back into the tomato business in the spring so you plant things that you can harvest before then? And then I hope you have a great, great, great end of summer rolling into fall, winter, and have a wonderful garden experience. Thanks so much for coming out and listening. See you again soon. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you again. Bye.